The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we're in our series Hall of Fame. We are in part number three and today we're going to be talking about Enoch. Now there is a lot of misunderstanding in the body of Christ when it comes to who this man is. Today we're going to look at a couple places in the Bible where his name is mentioned. His name is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. It's in the genealogy in the book of Genesis and then we're gonna look at Jude where his name is mentioned again now his name is mentioned one other time in the book of Matthew but it's just a reference of his genealogy again the same as it was done in the book of Genesis so we're gonna only gonna look at Genesis today we're gonna to look at Hebrews and we're gonna look at the book of Jude now there's a lot of controversy that people have they say oh there's this thing going out there there's this thing out there called the Book of Enoch. Now, before we even get into the lesson today, I want to clarify a point. The Bible itself, whatever has been canonized and put into the Word of God, is the only thing you can trust that is from God. It doesn't mean that God hasn't spoken things to people, but the only thing that you can trust 100% that is of God is what is in your Bible. So if you cannot see it with your own two eyes and your own Bible, then you do not receive anything else. That's a very important point. If you were to take, there's a thing called apologetics, which is called the defense of the faith, where you can study how to argue points and defend what is in your Bible. If you were to go and do that, which is something we don't do at this church, but you can do it. I took a class on it when I was in college. But if you take apologetics, you'll realize that the way in which the Jews put the Bible together, and they are the only people that had the right to do it. The way they put the Bible together is of God. They, and without going into that fully, you would just have to go and study it if you want more on that. But what is in your Bible is of God. What is not in your Bible is may or may not be. So you cannot trust and put your faith in anything that is not in your Bible. So today we're not going to look mainly about, you know, all of the things that most people talk about when they talk about Enoch. I want to look at the verses where his name is mentioned and I want to see if we can find some undergirding truth about this man. Some things that can help us in our walk with God. So let's get ready to start. I only have one quick announcement. We do have our end times curriculum tonight. So if you are planning on taking our part two, which is our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of the Revelation, 
you need to be taking part one, which is tonight at 7 p.m. So please make sure you're in class. But let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. I was going to read this verse yesterday, but as it seems fitting, we're going to keep it where it's supposed to be in the story. So let's go to Hebrews 11 and let's start in verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. One of the greatest truths in the Bible when we teach biblical faith is the truth of Hebrews 11 verse 6. That for those that want to please God, you must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's two parts. A lot of times people say, you must, to, have, to please God, you got to have faith. But they really don't understand what they, they don't really understand what that means. Based in Hebrews 11 verse 6. You must believe that he is. That's believing in his nature or his character. Meaning that God says, I am a healer. Or I am a provider. Believing that he is who he says he is. Believing in his nature or his character. But you also must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There are people that believe God is a healer, but they don't believe that healing is for them. They don't believe that if they were to seek the Lord that God would actually heal them. I know people that believe that God can provide, meaning he has the power to do it. He has the angelic uh movement in the heavenlies to help assist in the process like God can provide but they don't believe that if they seek after God with all their heart God will provide for them this is where faith really becomes the make it or break it point for a lot of people because though they believe certain things they don't believe all things I know people that believe God will do things in their life Yet they don't believe that's his nature or his character. They believe that if they give God all of their heart when, they're, when they have cancer and they seek after him with everything, they believe God will do a miracle and heal them. But they don't believe that's his character. They believe it's going to be a one-off thing. They don't believe that's you know, what he does on a regular basis. I know people that look to me in the face and say, I don't believe God is a healer. But they were sick seeking the Lord. So this passage in Hebrews 11, 6 is very powerful because it shows the difference in believing in who he is versus the fact that he will reward them that diligently seek after him. Meaning that if you ask, it will be given. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened unto you. That if you as a good father give good gifts how much will your heavenly father give to them the ask of him so hebrews 11 verse 6 is one of the most powerful verses in the bible but is directly connected to this man enoch it's connected to the fact that he had a testimony that he pleased god meaning that in his life he believed in who god said he was I think it's powerful to remember that while Enoch was on the earth, so was Adam. The man that walked with God in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. That man. Enoch was around in the same time period that that man Adam was walking. That's a very powerful point. We got to know that Enoch was already translated, but he was translated right before Noah came. Remember that man Noah we talked about yesterday, the man that was walking with God. He was moved with fear. He believed God. He was a preacher of righteousness also. 
He could look back through his genealogy and see a man, a man named Enoch, who pleased God, who was taken. I think what's so powerful about this story in particular is that you have two men in the Bible that were never seen death. The man, Enoch, who was translated, that he should not see death. And he was not found. We're going to look at that story in just a second in the book of Genesis. But then also you have Elijah, chariot of fire, whirlwind to heaven. So you have two men that haven't died in the Bible. What's interesting about that is it says that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Paul said, we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them that are asleep. Which means there's only two ways. Jesus said you can't get to the Father but through the Son. There's only two ways to enter into the eternal kingdom. One is through death, meaning that you die. You go to sleep and then you get raised at the resurrection. The second is that you are alive when Jesus comes back the second time. So you've got like one of two options. You either die or you're still here when Jesus comes back. But what's interesting is the Bible says that God will send two witnesses. Two witnesses will come and testify. What's so powerful about that? And what I have told people is my belief on that is these two witnesses will be Enoch and Elijah. I think that's a pretty fair assumption. That's just my opinion. That's not a prophecy. That's not a doctrine. That's just what I believe personally will be the two witnesses. Because the Bible also says in the book of the Revelation that these two witnesses will have the power to, uh, uh, to, to, to bring forth the judgments of God on the earth. And they'll die, they'll be laid in the street for three and a half days, and then they'll be raised. So I believe that right there is going to be Enoch and Elijah. I, I believe that there's two men in the Bible that you see that have powerful testimonies of miraculous miracles and witnesses of God it would be these two men we don't have much to go on when it comes to the to the man Enoch but we do know that uh, that him and Elijah did not see death but go with me to Genesis chapter 5 I want to read this other part about this man Enoch and like I said I don't want to get so far off on a tangent I know people that have said oh there's this book of Enoch and you can read that and all of these things and you know this is that and this is that and they make up their own doctrines or beliefs about certain things based off of what they read outside of the Word of God now I'm not saying you can't go read it I'm just saying that to base a doctrine or a belief system on something outside of the canonized Word of God is very dangerous because you can't prove it biblically that's why we said from the beginning that you can only truly put your faith in what you can see with your own eyes and your own Bible. So that's a, that's a very important thing. If you actually study the definitions of the name Enoch, you know, his, his name and you study it, inside of the definitions, it's known that whatever is canonized in the Word of God is the only thing that you can trust. And that there are Arabic fables and there are stories where they use this man's name though you can't actually trust that what it's saying is true it's actually when you study the definitions and the concordance that's actually part of the excerpt is a reminder that you can only receive what's in the Word of God so not only are we learning things about this man and his life but his life as a whole is a witness and a reminder to only trust the Word of God. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. And Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he got Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, that's a very powerful statement. Just a couple verses in the book of Genesis. This man, Enoch, was the son of Jared. And Jared's talking about the fact that he was a descendant 
meaning that he was a descendant of the lineage of Adam, the lineage of Seth also. Now this word Enoch is very powerful because not only is the word Enoch used in Genesis chapter 5, but the name Enoch is also used in Genesis chapter 4. So one of the hard things for a lot of people when it comes to the Bible is understanding that names, the names sometimes are repeated through different generations or through different people. You know, like you have multiple Judases in the Bible. You know, you got to try to figure out who's who and you got to watch the lineage because Cain had a son named Enoch where they built a city of Enoch. But then you also have Enoch through the lineage of Seth. So you have to be very careful when you study the Bible that you are studying who is who. Because you could have a man named Enoch from the lineage of Cain. And then you could have a man named Enoch from the lineage of Seth. So two very different people. You just got to make sure you're watching who's who when you study the Bible. But the point being is that it says he walked with God. And he was not for God took him. And we know that it said he had a testimony of his life that he pleased God. So in his walk with God, and the fact God took him, it says that he must have believed that God is, and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's something you can learn about the life of this man. That in his walk with the Lord, he pleased God. Because he decided to believe God for his nature and his character. And you might say, well, Cody, why is that so important? I just said that Enoch was not on the earth when Noah was born. But we remember if we study what we if we remember what we studied yesterday, is that because of the days of Noah, what the, the point of the days of Noah is, is it's a violence across the whole earth. Which obviously must not have started with Noah. It, it, it had to have been going on for a minute to have touched the whole earth. Which means when Enoch was on the earth, he was believing the nature and character of God, and he was believing that God would reward him in the face of extreme adversity. It probably wasn't as extent as the days of Noah filling the whole earth, but it's something that was taking place across the earth in a great measure up to that point because you had not only the lineage of Seth but you had the lineage of Cain across the whole earth now I want to look at one more place in the Bible for just a second before we get ready to finish I want you to go to the book of Jude now the book of Jude is only one chapter it's the book right before the book of the Revelation so if you're having a hard time finding it just flip all the way to the back of your book and go backwards from Revelation and you'll end up at the Epistle of Jude. Probably only one to two pages in your Bible. Now, the book of Jude is very powerful because the book of Jude has a lot of prophetic scripture dealing with the generation that the Lord returns. Prophesying of um, the things that will be taking place across the whole earth. Now, I mean, even stuff like Sodom and Gomorrah, you have stuff dealing with Cain, Michael the Archangel, uh, praying in the Holy Ghost. I mean, you have some very powerful teachings out of the book of Jude. Maybe we'll take a day and actually study verse by verse through the entire book of Jude. But I want to look at just a couple of these verses that we're going to pull out of this book. Now, we could go back and read the part where it talked about Cain, but I want to jump right into where it speaks about Enoch. So if we go to verse 14, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, thing, of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, these are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their own and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having meant persons in admiration because of advantage. Now that's a very powerful statement, 
And if you say, hey, Cody, how do we know? Because I just said that the man Enoch, there's two of them. In Genesis 4 and 5, there's two different Enochs. There's the Enoch of Cain, and then there is the Enoch of Seth. Well, the Enoch of Cain is the eldest son of Cain. So he's the third from Adam when it comes to that lineage. But when you look at the lineage of Seth, if you count the people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh person is Enoch. So this is referring to the man that was taken and did not see death. So now we have a couple main points about his life. In the book of Hebrews, we know that he pleased God. And we, the only way you can please God is the fact that you have to believe in God and who he is, his nature or his character. And then you must believe that he will reward them that diligently seek after him. Me, so Enoch walked with God, meaning that he trusted God's character and he believed that God would reward him. So that's two main points when it comes to Enoch. And then when we go and look in Genesis chapter 5, we see that Enoch's name means dedicated. So he's dedicated to God and he was on the earth and he was not, for God took him. So God took a man that walked with him, that pleased him. So a walk with God that is pleasing is what allows you to be with the Lord. It's a powerful statement, but that's a, that's a main undergirding truth that we learn from this, li this man's life. So often when people look at the life of Enoch, they want to debate everything under the sun except for the fact that this man pleased God. That's the most important thing about this man's life. He trusted God. He believed God's character and he believed God rewards them if you go after him with all of your heart. But then also, he's a man that prophesied. Now that's a powerful statement. The Enoch prophesied. Now, if you think of the context, remember, think of the context of what's going on in this generation when he was alive. He was on the earth before the flood. He was on the earth where violence grew and grew and grew to the extent that God flooded the entire earth. So there's a lot going on in that story. But you have to see the fact that he's in a culture that's very different than me and you right now. He's not facing certain things in his lifetime that you face. There's no rain. You face rain. Enoch never had rain. The rain didn't start till Noah came. So that's a, that's a very powerful point. But then also, Enoch was in a place in life where the, the, the extreme judgment of God had not yet taken place. So for him to prophesy of a judgment so extreme as the Lord coming with ten thousands of saints to execute judgment, that's a powerful thing to say. Now, a lot of scholars have taken different views on what the book of Jude means when it comes to this prophecy of what he talked about with 10,000 saints. A lot of people make wild assumptions. I will go ahead and tell you, I believe that what it's talking about is the Lord coming with his saints is what's talked about in Revelation 19 when the man on the white horse whose name is Faithful and True comes to judge and make war. And he comes with his saints riding with him. And that's when he's coming to execute judgment across the whole earth and to institute the millennial kingdom of the Lord. Now that's powerful because Enoch was prophesying thousands, not even 1,000. We're talking about, I, I had to do the math, what, 6,000 years in advance of something that was going to take place later? I mean, we're talking five or 6,000 years in advance. Was this man prophesying of the coming of the Lord? Now, that's powerful. Because what here, here's, the, here's the point of the judgments of God prophesied out of this man. Why this is so important. I don't want to talk about what he said, per se. Nor do I even want to talk about some of the things that people think he said. Or the correlations that come with it. What I want you to think about is the fact that what undergirds this man's life to be able to do this. He was on the earth, and the earth had not seen a judgment from God like, like, I mean, we look back at the flood, 
and see the fact that God will bring forth judgment through fire this time. He did water one time, he's fire this time. The next time God does it, it's going to be fire against the whole earth. But the point being that you have a man that prophesied beforehand, before the first big judgment of God, the flood, ever took place, this man was talking about it. What must he have faced persecution-wise to have remained faithful to see the promises of God, believing God's character and believing God will reward him, when nobody on the earth had seen what he was talking about? This man's life is so powerful. And, and like I said, I pray you study it through the context of just really not arguing the points of his life, but learning the things that you can from his life. He pleased God because he believed in God's character and God would reward them that diligently sought him. And that's what a walk with God looks like, to be able to be with the Lord for all of eternity. And you can trust in God's faithfulness even when prophesying of the impending judgments of God. We're out of time today, so Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son. Father, I give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. I pray you have a great day today. Please make sure you are in class tonight if you're taking our end times curriculum. And remember, you can always go online and purchase any curriculum. When you purchase the curriculum, it would auto-enroll you in the class. So that way you can jump in and take anything you would like. But church, I love you. I pray God blesses you. Make sure you have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Have a great day. Sparrow's not worried about tomorrow, or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I? You take good care of me The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. Take good care of me